without further ado, let's do a quick in round of introductions. Uh, Willem, you want to do it first? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Willem Dekker. Uh, I've been working in the software uh, engineering industry for over 15 years. Um, mostly I worked on Java, and, and Java applications and especially Java enterprise applications. Um, so I will be here the rest of the day. If you uh, have any questions uh, uh, regarding this talk, you can uh, uh, find me here um, uh, at some other talks or perhaps at the Luminous booth, and uh, uh, please uh, uh, ask me anything. Okay, uh, so my name is Bert Erdman. I've um, been around for a long time and doing Java for my entire career since 95. Um, been building lots of distributed systems uh, over the times, and uh, for some reason, uh, distributed systems is all hot again. So we thought it was about time to do a talks on the perils of distributed computing. And um, well, uh, basically, we've been building a lot of those systems ourselves. And we want to warn you for all the traps and pitfalls that we see when we start building distributed systems. Uh, both of us work for uh, Luminous. And we do lots of uh, system implementations uh, uh, for our customers. And besides those kind of things, I also have a number of internal responsibilities. I also run the Luminous Academy, uh, which organizes conferences and training courses and all kinds of free uh, knowledge sharing events. So without further ado, let's go into the uh, content of this presentation. So I want to take you back to 1994. And um, in that time, a guy called Peter Deutsch, which was one of the fellows at Sun Microsystems back in the days, wrote a paper which he titled The Fallacies of Distributed Computing. And back then he listed seven. And those seven fallacies were about um, the assumptions that we as designers of distributed systems, as architects, uh, do and we like to make, uh, which, but which prove wrong in the long run. And this is because when we start designing such systems, we mostly start on a single system, then we run a couple of tests, and even if we build a distributed prototype, we probably still run it from a single box or in a very isolated environment with multiple systems. And then we don't see what actually will happen uh, when we put these systems under stress uh, in production. Now, a couple of years later, a guy named James Gosling, who we now all know as the father of Java, uh, added another such fallacy, uh, which then uh, added up to the eight fallacies of distributed computing. And you might have read the paper, um, and uh, if you haven't, it's a uh, highly recommended read. Now, if you look at this list of fallacies, you see that they are um, uh, mostly network and infrastructure related at first sight. And, but if you look at them in the sense of time, I mean, back in the days, um, with Sun Microsystems, it was all about the network. And Sun had this payoff about the network as the computer, if you still remember, right? If you've been around long enough, you probably know it, the network as the computer. And, and back in those days, second half of the 90s, that was probably wishful thinking. But today, we have largely realized the vision of the network as the computer. And whether you call it cloud or whatever, right? We now have the network as a computer. So this means that Sun was actually pretty visionary when it came to these fallacies, and that today they are probably never more true, right, if we now have this network as a computer. So what we try to do, Willem and I, is we, well, we took this eight, these eight fallacies and we tried to translate them into something that developers um, understand today. So, so, so very freely translated, uh, we think the paper says the network hates us, right? And, and to make it worse, right, it also means that the cloud hates us too, right? So we don't know what we've done to these kind of things, but apparently they hold an unhealthy grudge against us developers. Now, okay, that's all fine, but the problem starts when we as developers think, well, we have fast computers nowadays, distribution has never been easier than today, so, yeah, well, I'm probably okay, until you're not. And then it becomes a story of fault tolerance, right? So how fault tolerant is your distributed design? And it's, it's a matter of either being fault tolerant or you know, the opposite of fault tolerance is, well, it's all your fault tolerance, and this is, this is probably not very healthy for your job, right? 
And even though, when we do distribution today, we use very simple protocols like HTTP and what have you, right? Still lots of crazy stuff can go wrong on the wire, right? And this is basically also what this talk is about, just to warn you for, well, making these assumptions about the network as a dependency in between your um, uh, pieces of computing, whether it be microservices or what have you. So, so what we're after is something which is called resilience, right? And resilience is the ability of a system to handle unexpected situations at all times. And this is not easy because it requires you to think about all kinds of situations which can occur in production up front. And while we think that designing up front is already hard enough, right? Thinking about problems which may or may not be there in production is probably even harder. Now, the greatest thing that you can do when you, have, when you build resilient systems is to build a system that is able to, well, where the user won't even notice that something is off, right? So this means that you have backup plans in place all, all over the place in your application landscape, right? So you have a plan A, and if it doesn't work for some reason, you go to plan B or maybe even plan C or what have you, and then if all else fails, right, then you still have another thing which we call graceful degradation. And graceful degradation is that, well, you take out some functionality of the application, which you cannot currently deliver because you have an outage, uh, but then still the rest of the application is pretty much still functioning, right? So imagine a shopping website and you have a failing recommender service, right? Now you can still offer the user the shopping experience, but you cannot offer him any recommendations. So you just take the component of the page and he won't probably even notice it. Maybe he's even glad about it because he's less tempted to buy stuff, right? All right, so we want to take you through these fallacies. And, and we then, we could, of course, it's a presentation, so we could go through it bullet by bullet and take you through all these boring eight points, but that's not the way that we had in mind. So we decided to come up with a case. Let's pretend that we have a website which, is, uh, which has a distributed architecture and will then slowly experience uh, some of the problems which will follow out of these fallacies of, of, of distributed computing. So, well, both Willem and I are, are fans of whiskey. Uh, so we built this website called Liquid Sunshine, right? And um, we want to have, well, a modern web shop selling great products. So, well, let's imagine for the rest of this talk that we will rerun this site, right? And then Liquid Sunshine is our well, modern web shop. We sell awesome stuff. Uh, we want to have great products. We want to offer you great customer service, customer intimacy, what have you, right? Like all of the websites out there. So our architecture, it looks a bit like this. So we have a web application, dynamic something, right? And then we have a database with a product catalog and where we store our orders, etc. You know the drill. Then when we start running this into production, right, after a while, when the load will increase and we become more and more popular, the web application will probably become slow or sluggish, right? So well, what do you do in such a case? Well, probably you want to scale it up, so you want to do horizontal scaling. So we just add a couple of application instances, and that will take it for a while. But then, after a while, your web application might become slow again, right? Too many users or what have you, but you will run into trouble again over time. And this time, it may not be as easy as just scaling up the web application part because we might be dealing with a transitive dependency which is actually not keeping up with the load. So imagine in this case, it's the database. So the database is no longer to keep up with the load of the many application instances, so well, what do you do? Well, you start looking into it, and then you figure out you have a turtle trapped in your database. So, yeah, that will probably get it more sluggish. So, in that case, well, what can you do? You probably buy a bigger or better database. That's what companies do, right? So you send more money to Oracle or what have you. Okay, so at some point in time, well, while we were doing all these kind of things, we suddenly realized, oh my God, we have now built a monolith. And if you keep up with the latest and greatest in, in IT, you have learned that monoliths are actually really, really bad, right? So monoliths, no good. So we decided at this point, 
to switch to microservices. Because, yeah, well, it's what everybody does, so it must be good, right? Yeah, and by the way, Amazon does it too, so, yeah. So at that point, we completely revamped and overhauled our application architecture. So we broke our website down into capabilities and, 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 and what have you. And we came up with this beautiful design of having many, many smaller services instead of just one dynamic web application that we had before, right? And some cool dependencies between services, right? So, yeah, this is, this is a really modern architecture. It's distributed, many, many smaller services, which well, actually are the capabilities of what we are trying to offer you. So we have now successfully cut up our monolith into a number of capabilities, and we have this beautiful architecture. So at that point in time, we were feeling pretty happy about this, right? So, yeah, we have cats riding unicorns, right? So what could possibly go wrong? Well, at first, it ran pretty well. But then, one early morning, right, we got a phone call. And it appeared that our website was slow. So apparently something was wrong. Now you have to understand here that, well, I mean, since we're dealing with the liquid sunshine and it's alcohol related, our users tend to get upset quite easily. So we immediately started looking into this, right? And we found that a lot of users were experiencing bad response times, okay? So we glanced at our beautiful architectural diagram and then we figured out that the site was slow, the UI was slow, because one of our services was actually very slow. In this case, the special offer service was actually, well, it appeared to be the culprit, right? So we started looking into this, well, at first sight, pretty insignificant service. And we figured that it wasn't the special offer service per se that was actually causing trouble but it had a failing transitive dependency, right? It had a, it had a failing dependency. For, for some reason, it was calling into the purchase history service, which was then again slow, and then because the purchase history was very slow, then special offers became very slow, and then eventually our site became very slow. So what we are dealing with here is something that we call cascading failures, and that's a scary thing. Cascading failures are a really scary thing, because this means that potentially one tiny service, in this case the um, a purchase history service, can potentially take down your entire service landscape, right? And that's, that's worrying if you think about it. So let's, let's dive into the covers a little bit and, and, and see what's actually happening. So imagine our application to run on a web server, and then this web server obviously has a thread pool, right? And the thread pool has a finite number of threads, so most Standard web applications have typically 200, 250 threads. You can, of course, tune it, but let's say it has 250 threads. It doesn't really matter for the rest of the story. Now, when a user comes in, the user starts hitting the web server with a request, and then one of the threads in our thread pool will pick up that request, and it will then put the request to an actual service, right? asking for an answer to something. If all behaves well, the service will respond, and then the thread will get the response back to the user and everybody is happy. But as soon as something is off, for example, when the special office service becomes very slow or when it starts throwing errors at you after a little while, right, then the threat will be blocked for a while, right? And this can be for quite a while. It can be seconds, can also be minutes, right? And now, at least we have, well, we have at least one user which is unhappy because he has to wait for a long time before he hears, hears anything back from our application. As long as there's still other users accessing other services in our site, it's not that bad. Maybe you have one or just a few users affected, right? But the majority of your users is still, well, perfectly happy with your site. So it's not such a big deal. But eventually, when more and more users will start hitting pages that offer the special offers to you, right? more and more threads will eventually start calling into the special offer service. And if it's still behaving badly, 
right? Then more and more threads will start to suffer. This will eventually drain your thread pool because now all the threads will be blocked waiting for a response from the special offer service. And as long as more users keep on coming in, right, you will have a lot of users which will probably be unhappy. And then next thing is that queues start to form with users that won't even get a, uh, a, a web page. Right? They are just waiting for the server to return anything because it has no uh, uh, free threads. Now, this is, uh, I think we can agree this is a bad thing, right? And, well, although it's, it's a bad thing, but then, as you can see, the alcohol consumption will raise as well, and this is actually good for our business, so it's, we have a little bit of mixed feelings here. But as long as no user can actually access our site, it's, it's a bad thing. So, at this point, yeah, we have a problem. So, Willem, I will give over to you, and can you please talk us through the problem and also um, through the solution? Uh, if we look at uh, our code, which is calling to the special offer service, uh, it's, it's a pretty simple uh, piece of code. We um, uh, get a connection, we uh, get some data from the remote service, and we transform it back into an object. So what could go wrong here? Well, if I run this code on my local machine, uh, probably not that much. But since we are having here a distributed architecture, then suddenly a lot of things can go wrong. Um, we could have, uh, for example, have troubles getting a connection uh, because uh, the network is not configured correctly or perhaps uh, there is a firewall in the network which is preventing us from getting a connection or perhaps our target service is just slow and that can be because it's getting a lot of traffic or it's just poorly implemented or perhaps uh, the network itself is slow. It's, it's getting hiccups also because of, of components in the network uh, what uh, could even worsen these effects is that if we get a response back uh, with multiple packages, uh, the responses will be even slower. So all these things can cause uh, uh, problems um, on our side of the service and will block our service for an amount of time. So how do we deal with it? Well, what we must do here is set timeouts on our connection. And we set uh, two types of timeouts. Uh, one a timeout for uh, obtaining the connection, and one uh, for reading the data. So if you uh, get the first timeout, it's almost certainly a problem in your network. Uh, the other timeout uh, can be both uh, things. It can be a problem in the target service or on the network itself. Uh, we set these timeouts explicitly uh, because the defaults are mostly not that good. Uh, like Beth already said, they are set to uh, uh, minutes or sec uh, 10 seconds or something like that, or even worse, some drivers have them set to indefinite, and that will cause this uh, to block forever. So it's important uh, to set these timeouts. Um, and with having these timeouts, we solve our problem. Right? So the timeouts will cause our threads to unblock, and they are available again for serving new requests. And we get these, uh, can set these timeouts pretty aggressively. Uh, because if our network uh, and our machines are behaving normally, we won't uh, get these timeouts and things just uh, work as expected. And it's important to fix our current problem to apply these timeouts to every call, also down the stream, because uh, in our case, our special offer service is uh, also calling to another service, which is actually causing the problem. And if we don't set the timeouts there, we get the same problems in our special offer service. So, Having these timeouts fix our problem, we are uh, uh, back up and running again. Everybody's happy. Uh, I don't see what could possibly go wrong now. No. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay. So yeah, this this seems like a pretty straightforward solution, right? And uh, just to stress a little bit, well. What Willem said, if, you ha if your services have dependencies, then make sure you apply these timeouts also to the dependency of the service that you set the timeouts to, right? So it won't go wrong further down the line. So yeah, this seems like a straightforward solution. We were all happy. And I think it lasted for a couple of days, maybe. And then at some point, our team got a phone call again. And it appears that the site was slow. And this time, as we see multiple turtles, so it's probably slower than before. Now, you have to understand that since we are selling alcohol, our users are actually pretty easy to upset, right? So when we dove into this, we figured that we had now both bad response times and also an awful throughput, 
So this time, problems appear to be worse than before. So, so we started looking into this. And um, we were looking what was actually causing these kind of problems. And we discovered right, that it was the special offer service again, which was causing trouble. So we wondered, well, what could be wrong this time? Because we just fixed it, right? We applied the timeout, so, so we, we fixed the problem. So what could be wrong now? And we figured out that this special offer service was now massively generating timeouts. Right? So the good news is our timeouts appear to work. But the bad news is somehow it was affecting all the users on our site, which is not really good news. So let's take a look at what was actually happening. So we had a user coming in, which was using one of the threads in our threads pool to, in order to be served. And that thread was now calling into the special offer service. But that thread was protected with the two timeouts that Willem just showed you. So connection was set up all right, but then the special offer service wasn't responding in time. So we had to wait for a little while, and then the timeout would go off, telling us, well, uh, the special offer service isn't responding in time. So it's freeing up the blocking thread, but before it frees up the thread, we are waiting for a little while. Right? So if enough users come in that start hitting special offer service, right, then eventually all of the threads in our thread pool have to wait for a little while before being freed up again. And this will eventually cause delays in, in request handling all over the site, right, affecting many, many users because all of the users will eventually get timeouts and this is slowing down everything. It starts to get worse when the number of incoming requests is becoming higher than the throughput that we are able to handle. So when we did our dry run, we figured out that the special offer service was able to run a certain number of requests per second, for example. Right? So let's say it was able to handle 8 or 10 requests per second. But now, because of all the, um, if you have an, a peak in load, for ex example, and then all the timeouts uh, added to that, it may be that the throughput that it can offer is no longer on par with the amount of requests coming in. And this will only make things worse, because uh, after a little while, we're completely draining our thread pool with all threads having to wait for a little while to get a response back, in this case, a timeout. Um, so, so we're getting both a timeout, meaning we can't functionally offer the functionality of the special service, right? But then we still have grateful degradation. But now new users coming in can't get a thread from our thread pool, so once again, a line will start to form. And if enough users keep on coming in, this line will become indefinite, and the, uh, also the special offer service is no longer able to, to, to come back from this maybe temporary outage, because it's, 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 keep, it's kept being hammered with new requests, and it can't keep up with the, the number of incoming requests. Right? So yeah, this, this appeared to be a problem. And timeouts, well, they offer part of the solution here, but timeouts alone are just simply not enough. So when we started investigating, we found out that someone hired a new sales cannon in the sales or marketing department, right? And he decided that it was a time to move the special offers and the special deal section to each and every page on our website. And well, with this request, he came to a developer, and then the developer said, oh, well, that's easy. We have a template, so I just do a very quick adjustment, right? And then slack off the rest of the day because it seems like a lot of work. And so now, from each and every page on our site, we are now calling into the special offers section. I mean, just making the change, running a little test on a single machine, that worked, right? That was easy. But then when you put this into production, and then when we got a sudden increase in load, which we didn't expect it, then this is where all the problems begin. Okay, so we could no longer keep up with the incoming requests, and then we had massive timeouts. So yeah, block threads, queues, users really unhappy. So Willem, can you tell us if we managed to fix this problem as well? Let's try that. So um, we have our timeouts, like Beth said, and they are working, but actually they're working a little bit too well because they are blocking all uh, of our uh, server uh, requests. So what is the solution here? Uh, since we know that, that the remote service, a special offer service, isn't working, it's actually no use in calling it. So we need a sort of mechanism to detect that the service is not available and then stop calling it at all because we only uh, get timeouts from it. 
And that solution uh, is uh, captured in a pattern, a stability pattern called a circuit breaker. So uh, we want to try this uh, to solve this problem. So what is a circuit breaker and how does it work? Well, a circuit breaker uh, you put in front of your remote service call uh, so that every call to that remote service will go through the circuit breaker. And if it's uh, operating uh, normally, the remote service, then it lets the call just uh, go through. And that is called that the, cir that in, then the circuit breaker is in a so-called closed sa state. But then when it's getting timeouts, uh, it keeps track of them. And after a certain threshold, so a number of timeouts in a given uh, period of time, it will say, well, I think this uh, uh, remote service is broken, so I will trip the circuit and I go to open state. And that means that all next requests won't even go to the remote service, but uh, return immediately with an exception. And uh, of course we get then an exception, but we can handle that exception and give another response. But at least we have a response, and that's al al always better than no response at all. Uh, that's not ev everything what the circuit breaker does. What it also does is that it uh, starts sort short-circuiting uh, requests, but then after a while it lets one call through. Uh, here you see after 80 uh, requests, it lets one call through, and then it tests if the service is back up again. If that's the case, then it goes to closed state again, and everything goes back to normal operation. If it's not, it stays open and starts short-circuiting uh, short circuiting again. So how do you implement such a thing? Well, you can probably imagine how to do this. Uh, you just keep track of uh, the amount of failed requests. And then uh, if it reaches a certain threshold, then just don't call that remote service. But it turns out there's an excellent library available uh, from Netflix, which is called Hystrix. And with that, you can wrap your remote service call um, in a Hystrix command. And that Hystrix command, you can just instantiate as a normal Java object and call execute on it. And the execute method will uh, apply the circuit breaker logic. So if the circuit is closed, it will just forward the call to the run method you see here and uh, calls the remote service. If the circuit is open, it doesn't uh, call that run method, but returns immediately with an exception. So um, to revise the solution, with a circuit breaker, uh, we uh, prevent uh, calling a remote service that is uh, not available at all. Um, and uh, that makes uh, our own service available for serving other requests. Uh, what's also a nice addition to this circuit breaker is that it also uh, prevents uh, from setting extra load on the broken service, so we can give it a chance to recover automatically. Okay, we uh, have built our circuit breaker. Um, that solves our problem, and uh, our servers are back up again. Everybody's happy. Now, what could possibly go wrong now? Yeah. Well, actually, Willem, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, this service breaker sounds like a really sophisticated thing, right? And I saw, I saw code, and I mean, yeah, this is, this is cool stuff, right? So, so I think we are, we are happy for a while now. Although we had a little beef with, with management, because, you know, after a couple of, uh, well, messed up situations that we had before, they decided to no longer give us pagers or phones, but they now equipped us with these kind of things. If you imagine what they are, they are dog color buzzers, right? So, yeah, so, 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 so we actually hoped for the best, right? But uh, I mean, with the timeouts and the circuit breaker in place, I don't think anything can go wrong from now on. But, you know, as time went past, I mean, I can, I can still feel the buzz, right? Yeah. So, so, so at some point, they, they started buzzing. And apparently, the site was slow again. And this time, <coughs> it seemed to be even worse than the last two times. Now, I have to tell you that since we sell alcohol, our users tend to get upset pretty easily. And so we immediately started fixing, right? So, so, so we dove into the problem, and we found that we had mm. bad response times and awful throughput. And this sounded familiar, right? So this is what we tried to fix last time. So we had timeouts, we had circuit breakers, and still we had the same kind of problems. So what the hell was wrong, and which service is causing this? So we looked into it, and we found it was that damn special offer service again. So, I mean, what could be wrong? So we looked into it, 
we started measuring stuff, and we found that the special office service was actually working, but it was slow. But it was not slow enough to cause a timeout, but it was slow causing a bit of delay. So let's say we had a timeout of 400 milliseconds, and then it was just giving a response after 350 or 380 or 390 milliseconds. So not enough to actually cause a timeout, but it was still slow. Now, as you can imagine, we are actually back to where we came from. Because if we had many, many pages calling into the special offer service, so when it's starting to slow down, right, it will slow the entire site down. And if enough threads are actually being caught waiting, even though we have circuit breakers and even though we have the timeouts, which are not tripped, right, so they are not triggered, so eventually everything will suffer from a service which is slowing down. This is again a cascading failure, one tiny service bringing down the entire landscape. So, and then if you have more load than expected, right, our thread pool isn't able to keep up, so once again we have lines forming and we have many more users coming in that we are able to handle. Uh, eventually when this will happen, eventually you'll probably also get real timeouts, which will make it works, it will make it worse, uh, but then we have the mechanisms in place to, to, to um, uh, repair that with the circuit breaker and the timeouts. But still, if it's, if it's too slow, the special officer, if it's slowing down, your entire site will hurt and you have cascading failure. So, so what we learned from this is that no matter how sophisticated it sounded, a circuit breaker alone is not enough to protect your distributed architecture. Right? As soon as you get an increase in load, and you are no longer able to keep up with the number of incoming requests, you will see the same kind of problems again. Right? It's just a little bit delayed. So somehow, Willem, we need to have another layer of protection. Please talk us through that. Yeah. OK, um, as Pat mentioned, our timeouts and circuit breakers aren't enough. So we need something else here. Uh, what we want is actually to control the number of threads uh, which can go out to a remote service. So we know that these can be blocked, but we have enough threads left uh, to serve other requests. And we can do this with a stability pattern called a bulkhead. So the term bulkhead is not something new. It's actually borrowed from shipping, where in shipping it means that uh, in case of a hull breach, you give a part of the ship, uh, but save uh, the rest. Uh, it's, ba and it's basically the same in software, where we can give up some of the threads, but we uh, at least have enough left to serve uh, other requests and keep our uh, system up. So how does this work? Well, like the circuit breaker, you put the bulkhead in front of your remote service call. Um, the request comes in, and then it uh, tries to call to the special offer service, but it needs to go to the bulkhead code. Here, uh, we set the size of the number of threads we are, able, we are willing to give up to three. So that means that at maximum, there are uh, three threads concurrently uh, able to access the remote service. If there are more threads uh, coming in, they will be rejected and fail fast uh, with an alternative result. So it could be an exception or it could also be something else. Um, and that also means, if you have that, that you have different user experience experiences. So some users will get special offers, uh, but a little bit slower response. And some users won't get special offers, but at least you have a quick response. And if you use this uh, pattern, these bulkheads, it's important that you set the bulkheads in front of all your remote service calls. Because uh, this problem could uh, not only happen at special offer service, but actually at every server, and you want to prevent that. So put them in front of all your remote service calls. Uh, then it's important uh, what the amount of threat is, threats are that you are willing to sacrifice. So how do you calculate that? Well, there's a, a simple rule of thumb uh, here to, uh, to calculate um, the size of your bulkhead. And that's basically you take the amount of uh, requests per second and multiply that with the average response time of your remote servers. Um, uh, that number uh, you take and add a little margin to compensate for fluctuating response times, and then you have the size of your bulkhead. In this case, we calculate it to seven. <laughs> so if you do that for all your bulkheads, uh, you need to sum that up, and you get a total amount uh, of 28 in our case, 
And that are actually the total amount of threads you're willing to give up in case, uh, in a worst case scenario, that every of the remote services are failing. So if we look at the amount of threads we have in total available, uh, Beth mentioned it earlier already, that, that are, a typical server has around 200 threads available. Uh, so we have more than 170 threads left to serve other requests. And I think that in our case, that's uh, pretty good. Um, then uh, finally, how to implement such a bulkhead? Well, there is no uh, definitive way to, to do this. Uh, this is an example using a semaphore. And a semaphore is basically a counter which allows control to a piece of code. So here you see uh, that uh, if a thread can get access uh, to the semaphore, it calls a remote service. But if it's full, then it fall back, falls back to the else branch and we give back a default response. So we've implemented this and it works for us. Uh, our problem is solved. Everybody's happy again. What could possibly go wrong now? Well, let's see. Um, yeah, so the, the, the nice thing about this approach is that we now have both have an extended protection mechanism, right, to protect us from these kinds of failures, but also the graceful degradation in place, right? So it's, uh, uh, well, one catch and two solutions. So after we added the bulkhead mechanism to our set of protection mechanisms, it turned out that it worked pretty well. So I think for number of weeks, we had no problems at all, and everybody was actually pretty happy. But then at some point, this guy came into our room, and apparently uh, we had troubles again. So we started looking at our side, and we figured out that it was slow again. And this time, counting from the number of turtles, uh, we had some real trouble going on. So yeah, you know the drill by now, right? So, so we immediately started looking into these problems. And we figured out that when we started measuring what was actually happening, that we didn't really suffer from bad response times this time around, because we had fixed that. But this time, it appears that all service calls were basically rejected. Right? So this was really a significant problem. What is happening? How can this be? So, so we, we dove into it and we started immediately to investigate this stuff because we thought, well, we have timeouts that will, will signal if something is wrong, either obtaining the connection or if it takes too long to get the answer. Then if we get enough timeouts, right, then we have the circuit breaker that will just you know, open the circuit to give us fill fast. So we have another layer of protection. And then we also have the bulkheads that just you know, allow us to sacrifice just a few threads, but I mean, with all these protection mechanisms in place, how can it be that we now again have a case where we made an assumption which appeared to suffer under load? So, so we started looking into the figures that, that we actually could obtain from production, and we found that actually all the bulkheads in our system that we had set protecting the service were now full of blocked threads, right? So, so all of the bulkheads were full, and then some new threads coming in they were trying to make a call, but the bulkhead was already full, right? So they immediately returned. So we had no answer. Or we had all grateful degradation answers. And if everything is grateful degradation, then you'll probably end up with a blank page, maybe. So, yeah, so how could this be? How could it be that all the threads get caught in our bulkheads and nothing works anymore? Well, it turned out that someone had, upgrade, had upgraded our client library. Right? And this started to mess things up. Now, let's say we were using the Apache HTTP client. I mean, I take it you all use Apache HTTP client probably, right? Who's using it? Yeah, a lot of people. Okay. So who of you actually knows its HTTP client? Right? Who of you downloads the sources and then goes over it line by line to see what it's actually doing? Right? How many people do that? Probably nobody, right? Some, okay, one person, okay, but, but you probably think I'm going to make fun of you otherwise, right? But well, maybe you download the sources and then you compile it yourself. So you have your own, you know, a binary version of it, right? You don't download the binary version from the site, but you, or, or from Maven Central or whatever, but you, you create your own. But actually nobody, or hardly anybody, actually goes over it line by line. Especially not if, it, like, after two weeks there's a minor update to it, then you don't do it again, probably, right? 
but actually you should because we are actually treating our client libraries as black boxes, right? And these client libraries also have protection mechanisms. And even in a minor release of our client library, it may be that they have, you know, with all good intentions, they have added a protection mechanism to their uh, uh, arsenal as well. So maybe when you make a connection using the HTTP client library, it also has a timeout mechanism. Or they have changed the way that you can pass configuration to it, which probably happened here. So we had figured out all our configuration, but then with the new release, it wasn't picking up our timeout settings. And therefore, our timeouts were gone. Still not such a really big thing because we still had the circuit breakers and the bulkheads in place. But then when our servers are starting to act up, when our loading increased, right? Then we saw our bulkheads filling up and because they were filling up, they couldn't be freed because we didn't have timeouts to actually cut off the threads and start over again, right? So our, one of our protection mechanisms was gone. So Willem, um, how do we fix it? Yes, that's an interesting problem. Um, our timeouts uh, aren't working as expected anymore, and our threads are blocked. So what we want is something to unblock our threads, uh, but not using our current mechanisms. So we need something new here. And there's a mechanism uh, called uh, thread pool handover, which, could, which might help us. Uh, thread pool handover is not a stability pattern, like, like the bulkhead or circuit breaker, but it's more uh, a generic way to create uh, timeouts on your code. So how does it work? Uh, you have your normal request thread pool, and you set next to that a new thread pool, which we call the service thread pool. And what happens in a, if a request comes in, it forwards uh, your remote service call to the service thread pool, will, which, that, uh, which then handle, which will handle the serv remote service call. And the request thread pool will wait uh, for the service thread pool thread to come back with an answer. And if it gets one, then uh, it returns it to the client. <coughs> Uh, what you also can do here is set a timeout on the wait for the answer. So that allows our request thread pool to always unblock and uh, return uh, an, a response to the client. So with that, uh, we, we can always unblock uh, our threads. So that solved part of the problem. But with this problem with the broken client library, this means that all our uh, threads in our service thread pool will be blocked and not be available anymore. So in a normal situation, we still need to set timeouts there uh, to make these threads unblocked. Um, now, uh, what also happens here, because we add an additional timeout, we actually back to the starting points of a bulkhead problem, because then uh, what could happen is that the uh, responses are still within the timeout, but still a little bit slow. So they will still block the request thread. So what we could do is limit the size of our service thread pool uh, to a fixed size. Here we set it to three threads, just like the bulkhead, and make sure that we don't queue uh, if there are no threads available for processing. And if we do that, we have an implicit bulkhead uh, built. So with this uh, solution, we implemented a generic way to introduce timeout and to safeguard our service against unknown and unexpected failures. And as a bonus, we get a bulkhead for free. Uh, how do you build such a thing? Well, you can do, can do it with a standard uh, Java executor service. You create one with fixed size and make sure that it doesn't queue. And if you, you can submit your remote service call code to that executor service, which will then handle the execution of that for you. And you get a future back, which you can block uh, on and with a set timeout. And if it doesn't come back within that timeout of one second in this case, then you get a timeout exception and you can at least unblock your thread. Uh, you, the other exception is more for the bulkhead. So if the all threads are occupied doing uh, work, then you get a rejected uh, execution exception, uh, which allows you to fail fast as well. Uh, an alternative to this solution is using Hystrix. So Hystrix uh, also has this mechanism built in. So instead of calling the execute on the command, you can call Q on it and you get also a future back and you can uh, also then wait for a response with the get. So you see here that we don't have the timeout set, 
but that's because it's a part of the configuration of Hystrix. And if you want a default response from your um, uh, get, then you can implement the fallback method. So in case of a timeout, it will return that result. Or if your circuit breaker is open, you get also that uh, result back. OK. So now we have all these stability patterns and thread pool handovers and, and timeouts. And if you have a lot of services, it can be quite a lot of work to build all this. And as also what's, what's pretty hard is to know how to tweak and tune this exactly. So which knob you need to turn and which setting you need to set to the correct value. So how do you start with that? Well, a good starting point uh, of this is monitoring. So uh, of course, you monitor your server on, for CPU and memory, but you could also monitor your integration points. And they can give you uh, lots of information which you can use to uh, uh, monitor your services, of course, but also to tweak and tune your services. Um, this is an example of what Hystrix can do. So it already keeps track of a lot of metrics for you, which you can then use uh, to uh, configure your system. Um, here you see some stuff like uh, requests per second, total amount of requests, uh, response times, the state of your circuit breaker, etc. cetera. Uh, so you can use all that information to configure your system. And if you want to get really fancy with this, you can even dynamically get this information and change your configuration at runtime. So yeah, so with this kind of uh, the, the, this kind of intel, we can then start actually uh, detecting where our problems uh, uh, are and then start solving them. Now the thing is with distributed um, architectures, uh, especially with microservices, etc., that you have so many moving parts as part of the architecture that there will always be failure, right? So failure should actually be treated as a very normal thing, and you should be ready for it. That's the whole resilience thing, right? So whatever you do on a single box or in a, a testing environment, in reality, there will always be even more and even nastier things, just like network hiccups and request burst, which are really hard to simulate. So the thing actually is, you put them in place at first, you start monitoring, and then you measure them while running in production, right? So you have to measure and don't guess just to get you know, an old saying out again. Now, the good thing is that you know, on the uh, level of testing here, we have a number of really interesting tools that can uh, help us by simulating um, all kinds of testing situations where we are actually dealing with the fallacies of distributed computing. Um, first off, when designing our interface and our services, when we design them for load and for stress, et cetera, we really have to think about client demand rather than on the supplier's definition, right? This is something that goes hand in hand with the architectural style of microservices, right? So know who's actually using your service and then make sure you're able to deal with it. Uh, so this, this calls for, well, maybe BDD style testing and probably it deserves its own talk, right? I'm just mentioning it for 10 seconds now, but uh, it probably it's, uh, it's worthy of its own talk to figure out how to do correct functional testing of, of, of microservices, for example. And then, and this is where this talk is about, all the nasty stuff that happens on the wire and which, you, you, which is harder to test um, uh, in a simulation, well, there's also a number of tools which can actually uh, help you with that. So, so really valuable stuff that, that we have run across is wire mock and saboteur. I, I highly encourage you to check that out, uh, which can help you to actually uh, mess with your network settings you probably want to run it from a uh, virtual image or, or from a Docker container, maybe, because otherwise it will mess up the network settings of your, uh, your computer. Uh, and then stuff like uh, Simian Army or Chaos Monkey from Netflix, which just uh, goes around and just randomly slashes your services and then sees what happens. Right? So that's actually a pretty cool test. Um, the big ballers, like Netflix, they actually run these kind of things in production. right? Um, so that's probably not a wise thing to start with. But eventually, if you've done everything right and you put the right mechanism into place, this is what you can do when everything will survive in the end. And then there's also things like good old JMeter and Gatling for load testing. So there, there's many, many useful things that I encourage you to check out. So just get a sign that we're out of time. So just want to quickly finish. Now, the moral of this story is that we have showed you a very simple case with some very simple scenarios for insignificant services. But this is exactly what will happen if you take a synchronous programming mindset based on a single box 
or a monolith design, and then you take it to a highly distributed architecture. Right? It's probably not us who make this mistake, right? but there's many, many people out there who see the beauty of microservices, download their latest and greatest framework, start implementing lots of services, and then when they put things in production, will run into these kind of problems. Now, we put in protection mechanisms on the client side, we stuck to our singleness probing model. I know, we know that there's many, many other things that you can do. You can also translate these protection mechanisms to the server side and protect the service. Or you can go for a completely asynchronous programming model, which are all other approaches to solving the same thing. But then, however easy it is to say asynchronous programming, in reality, it's raising the complexity bar again, because distribution is raising it. But adding asynchronous programming into the mix will make it even more complex. So this will probably give you a number of new challenges as well. Um, yeah. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you haven't done so, please stop by the Luminous booth and get your own custom-designed LEGO programmer uh, set. So thank you. <laughs>